Um, my name is Charles Sywin. I'm the program director for the Blueprint Neurotherapeutics Network. Um, thank you all for attending. I really appreciate uh, your time. Um, I'm going to dive right into it, but what I want to um, talk about today is the program in general and give an overview of the program, some feeder programs that might help you get data if you need it to enter the program, as well as some sort of other tools and do's and don'ts that I've picked up over the uh, last few years to help uh, applicants. So let's go into the program here. Let's say, oh, there we go. Uh, the program's vision is to really combine investigator-initiated ideas for novel drugs and, and, and strong disease biology assay models together with industry expertise, advisors from pharma experience and contracts that we have available through our network to put together a drug discovery team with you. Uh, to move your projects forward. We are focused on small molecule space, um, and so we, we aim to de-risk the, the therapeutics to a point that industry will invest in them, allowing the, hopefully new drugs to reach a patient efficiently. We're looking to obviously identify the best ideas uh, to move forward, and we provide funding both from to you uh, through grant mechanism as well as uh, through our network of consultants and contracts that are typically lacking in many small businesses and, and academic areas. Um, we need to uh, preserve the, um, your intellectual property to facilitate licensing. And um, do this uh, in order to uh, hopefully successfully move your project to the IND enabling stage. Um, as I said, it's really focused on small molecules, um, and you can enter either at the discovery phase or the development phase. And the way I describe discovery phase is if you're planning on doing more medicinal chemistry, more analoging, you're still in the discovery phase. If you are done and you've already identified your candidate or have a couple candidates and you have one experiment to figure out between them or something like that, um, then you're in the development phase. That's the definition I'm working under, and that will help you if you're looking at the funding opportunity announcements. The BPN is a blueprint uh, for neuroscience research program, and therefore um, it has a number of ICs uh, besides NINDS, which is my home institute, participating in it. So you have mental health, aging, child health, dental research, um, the Eye Institute, complementary health, and alcoholism all involved in this, as well, sorry, left out drug abuse, don't want to do that, that all potentially uh, uh, award grants for drug discovery projects in their purview. Um, the program itself is, as I said, structured with uh, consultants and contracts, and one of the unique things about it is it's really a very team-oriented program. It's a very interactive program. These are what's known as cooperative agreements. Um, and we will put together a team around you that includes you, as well as our, the consultants and NIH staff. Our LDTs, our lead discovery teams, lead development teams, meet every two weeks. Um, and so this is a very interactive program. It brings in literally hundreds of years of experience, industry experience, to your, to your team. What, is, what you have to have as a minimum is the biology expertise in your grant. So you can put together a team that, that, that consists and provides the, the biology package around the disease. So primary assays to drive SAR, in vitro, in vivo uh, models of the disease, those are your responsibilities to bring. Most everything else can be done through NIH contracts, but it's chemistry, which includes drug, man, I'm sorry, which includes uh, in vitro ADME work as well as um, uh, computational chemistry can all be done through our contract with AMRI. Our PK uh, can be done through our PK contracts, both rodents and uh, large animal like dog. Um, and we can also do the, the toxicology when the time comes, the, the dose range finding, the GLP toxicology. Drug manufacturing formulation allows us to uh, do the scale up. We do process work uh, to get it to from a med chem route to a route that's amenable to synthesizing like a kilo or more uh, to allow us to actually run the GLP tox studies and run the first phase one clinical studies. 
it's not going to be your final formulation for phase two and beyond. It's really going to be the formulation that gets you into the clinic. And we do have um, clinical uh, contracts as well to run the, uh, we typically run SAD studies, single sending dose studies, um, to get you that first in human experience. If you're in the discovery phase, we'll also give you access to our um, relational database system that stores all your data and allows you to plug in the data from what you're generating in your lab and the data from AMRI's medicinal chemistry and brings it all together into a cohesive um, system and also allows to, at the end of the project, to that all information back out um, and provide it uh, as a historical document to you. Your data is not intermingled with other projects' data. Each project has its own vault of data. Um, but the resources are tailored to your, thing, to your project. So let's just say, for instance, you already had a medicinal chemistry relationship. You could potentially apply and say, I'm going to do that. Um, there are some caveats to that. You need to explain um, why it's beneficial to do it that way, what the advantage is, and also um, the cost and so forth needs to be comparable and deliverables need to be comparable. Sometimes people have the missile chemistry but don't have the in vitro admi or the computational chemistry. We can give parts of that. It's either the whole package or parts. And I can do any, any of those three items in there. Um, to supplement your team. Some people have rodent PK but don't have large animal PK, and again, we can do that. Um, but again, I caution, and we'll talk about throughput and whether you have the ability to do it all in your shop. Um, as I said, you can enter anywhere along the, the spectrum. You can exit anywhere along the spectrum. So if you turn out that you want to, um, you know, our, our goal and the goal of every project come in that comes in should be outlining a plan from wherever you're starting to phase one. But that doesn't mean you, you, you couldn't exit. If you get a licensing deal at need optimization and you want to go off with your new partner and do something, that's, that's a win for us, it's a win for you, uh, that is fine. And we've had projects that have done that. Um, so don't um, think that you have to, you know, you're locked in with us. Um, but, you, you know, we are trying to get you to phase one. Um, it is a milestone-driven program, which is important to note. It does mean some projects do end up with attrition because they fail to meet scientific milestones. We're not making progress. We just can't justify moving forward with the project. Um, and that does happen uh, occasionally on projects, as it would in any drug discovery project. It is a two-phase grant mechanism, meaning uh, we award the first phase as, and it's sort of the kick the tires, make sure everything's working the way it's, it's planned. So if you become an exploratory phase, we may resynthesize your compound, do some benchmarking, make sure everything looks good, uh, show that the assays are performing the way they should so you can actually drive SAR from both a chemistry and biology point of view. If you're coming in at the development stage, that might be, you know, you need to, to redo an efficacy study and do a dose range finding study to get the therapeutic index. So that, that could be part of the preparatory phase. So it really does depend on where you're coming in. And then the, the second phase, which is usually, um, you know, in a UG3, UH3, it would be one year and, and four years at max for the second phase. In the U44 phase one, sometimes that's a two-year phase one, followed by a three-year phase two. Since SBIR limits phase two to three years, it can either be a a one-year phase one with a three-year or a two-year phase one with a three-year uh, max. So you can either be four or five years max, depending on what you have for your phase one. As I said, you can enter in across the spectrum. We give, everyone always asks, you know, what's the budget limitations? Um, these are guidances and not limitations. You should budget what you actually believe you need for the UG3, UH3 um, side of the equation. These are 300,000 in direct costs is what we typically give for guidance for the UG3 phase for um, the uh, first year and then up to one and a half million in direct costs for the out years um, with an asterisk there. If, you, if you're going to have more than 500,000 in direct cost on the UG3, UH3 in any year, you must uh, uh, contact me with a full set of uh, budgets and justifications and a well laid out thing at least six to eight weeks in advance so that I can do what's called an ARA process so that your application will be received. If you do not have that and they can't marry it up at the other side, they won't accept the application at, at receipt and referral. Now for the SBIR, we tell people 500,000 in total cost, not direct costs, 
uh, for phase one, or 700,000 across two years, um, and up to one and a half million in direct costs per year and three million across three years for phase two, there you don't have to ask permission if you're exceeding 500,000 in total cost. SBR has different rules than the general uh, application. Keep in mind, small businesses that don't apply or don't qualify for SBIR can uh, apply to the UG3, UH3. Um, the difference is if the SBIR is its own set aside, it has the ability to charge that uh, fee, which is a built-in profit, which you cannot do on the, on the general application side. The next receipt date is due October, or sorry, February 9th. Um, mixing my phone in my head here. But also keep in mind, as I mentioned before, not all ICs ex accept development projects. So if you look in the in the what the mission statements are in the in for the back of the photo, you'll see NIMH and NIDA, for instance, do not want uh, to take a development project in. So if you're just coming in with a clinical candidate, this is not the mechanism for you if you're in the mission of NIDA or NIMH. NIDA has other programs you could go to. NIMH, you would need to contact them on what the most appropriate route would be. Um, if you're from a foreign organization, um, you want to make sure that um, you let us know and we have a discussion about it. Uh, the reviewers will assess the project um, just as normal, but then they're asked at the end to uh, for foreign organizations to make a comment on does this project present special opportunities for furthering research through the use of unusual talent, resources, populations, or environmental conditions that exist in other countries that are either not available in the U.S. or augment existing U.S. resources. So that's the, that is the justification you, you need to actually hit. And it'll not only be, they'll, reviewers will make that comment, but not, not only that, it has to go to our council and be specifically voted on based on this. And so the case will have to be made for that. So if you're coming in from a foreign organization, um, you will definitely need to make that case and help me help you. Um, the milestones uh, are fairly uh, well defined within VPN for the generalized uh, progression through our uh, process, but obviously they're customized for each project team. The grant duration is a maximum of five years. Um, the SAD trial, for instance, could go on after the five years is up, right? We could contract it and, and continue it. Um, as I said before, early stage, it's all about showing me your assay is working, showing me you have a screening funnel that's operational and you have a, a target product profile that makes sense. Show me you have real chemistry here. Hit to lead, it's about the in vivo efficacy and the chemistry. Again, lead optimization, picking your candidate, establishing the, the PK and PD relationship, establishing a therapeutic index, at least in a rodent species. Um, in the pre-development, we move on to the large animal dose range finding studies, to, and those both those dose range finding studies are help us set the doses for the definitive GLP tox. But then we, then we also move into things like salt screen polymorph work, determining whether we actually have a, a tractable synthetic route that we can execute on in a, in a cost-effective way. Um, at this point, we want to know you have a clinical specialist so that when we're designing our talk studies, there's, there's something special we need to know about. We, we take in the proper tissues and we're doing the right things to enable the phase one and beyond. Um, the DIND enabling is all about, do we need a pre-IND meeting? Have you got your therapeutic index worked out based on GLP talks? Do you have the GMP synthesis worked out? And then we produce the clinical trial materials. And lastly, we'll open the IND and execute the clinical trial. So blueprint uh, intellectual property expectations. So inventorship is always determined by US patent law. And there's no way around that. Blueprint itself is not seeking a stake in you. So there's no terms to say you will give us a stake in your IP. Prior to the grant award, we will have you sign IP agreements in place with all the potential inventors who are going to be working on your project that are not NIH staff. So those are people who are the consultants and, and that you, we're assigning to you. And they'll, and they'll determine who will sign, who will hold title the IP and um, 
if there's any uh, royalty agreements, you have that all worked out in advance. Um, there's no expectation that you would, you know, we're not telling you you have to give royalties and we're not saying you shouldn't give royalties. You do what you think you would normally do with a consultant you've hired. Um, and NIH staff, we are not going to um, be mentors. Um, our staff are there to help facilitate. Um, and I take great pains not to uh, interject my individual ideas into your program. Um, even though I'm a missile chemist by training, I you know, will not say, hey, you should make this compound exactly, do this and this. That's what our consultants and, and our contractors are for. Our, our contracts, our missile chemistry contract and our drug manufacturing formulation contract have uh, clauses in them to assign the intellectual property to your institution. Um, but all these things should all be designed for unencumbered IPs, consistent with the program goal of making a licensable project. If you need more information, go to our website, and there's lots of information there that I may not be able to get today, including a recorded view of our webinar, sometimes a poster you'll see in this section. Uh, all of our emails are available on our, on our contact list if you click on our names. Um, it, the resources which goes into the individual contracts, and individual consultants, and what their backgrounds are, who our external oversight committee, and all of that. Um, if perhaps you're you're you don't have the preliminary data you need in terms of a you know strong uh, set of data to, for BPN, we do have a program called Ignite in in at least NINDS that uh, for things on that mission can help you get some of that data. So we have a a, a uh, funding opportunity to develop an assay and run a screen. Uh, we have a funding opportunity to develop an animal model and, and characterize a compound in the animal model. And you might need to actually do a little bit of med chem in there to optimize molecule enough to test it in the in vivo uh, thing. So you can do develop a model under 763. You can develop a compound and test an in vivo efficacy under uh, 761. All these things can help you get the data you need. Becky Roof is the uh, uh, program officer for that, and the next receipt date for that is in February as well. It's, again, it's a two-stage milestone-driven program, but it's not a cooperative agreement. So it is one where you can come in and, and uh, have your, as I said, you know, develop a model and then test it type of thing. Um, so let me finish out by talking about things you should be doing uh, for sure, and then we'll go to questions. Um, I'll maybe touch on a couple of things you shouldn't do too. Um, read the funding opportunity carefully. I can't stress this enough because there are things in each funding opportunity that are requested that you put in your application. Things like a table of uh, here's what the assay is, here's what we're going to do, where we're going to do, and what the throughput is, uh, and what you're going to ask NIH to do for you. That's really important not only for us for budgeting purposes to figure out whether you budget for everything, but it's also important for the reviewers to understand what you're asking us to do because NIH contractors are not subject to the review. Um, discuss your proposal with us. Bother me. It's not a problem. I'll try to get you on my calendar as quickly as I can. Tim does a marvelous job of keeping me uh, on calls all the time. Um, we do want to talk to you about your program and make sure that you're the right fit and this is the right time for you to come to this program and you have what you need. And we also want to make sure you talk to the whatever the Home Institute's program director is about the disease interest because ultimately whichever I see mission you're in is going to be paying the bill and you need their support because they have to take it to their council as well as our council to get it approved, the project approved for funding. Contact the SBIR uh, program director for any SBIR specific issues because each institute has its own set of SBIR rules and why I try to keep abreast of all of them as best I can, I am not going to be perfect in the changing environment that is the SBIR world. So you want to make sure if you have a specific SBIR question, you're asking the IC whose mission you're coming into SBIR contact for information and all those are listed in the back of the FOA at the end who the contacts are. Stick to the page limits. Don't try to circumvent them by changing the spacing. Don't try to circumvent them by changing your font down to micro font. It just upsets the reviewers and um, it doesn't really help you much. Uh, put forth a solid scientific preliminary data set 
that supports your proposal and addresses the rigor of the data uh, in your research strategy section. So don't bury the, that discussion in the vertebrate animal section, please. It needs to be part of it. It's part of the review criteria is to really determine whether the preliminary data that you have, preliminary data you're citing is rigorous data and that it's um, you know, properly powered, properly controlled, blinded, um, talk to those, those points and, and convince the reviewers that this data they have in front of them is really believable. Um, address any obvious criticisms. So if they talk to a chemist about your molecule, if there's something about the molecule, it has a structural flag, you need to call out and say, yes, I recognize this as a structural flag. It's gonna be part of the, the SAR and we believe we should be able to get around this. Um, Clearly indicate what will be done, and that was what I talked about as part of the grant and what will be part of the BPN contract. It calls for a table to do that. Please make sure you include that table. Include budgets for all years of the grant. So both the UG3 and UH3, both the phase one and phase two, have to be part of this original grant application. You need to give me budgets for all years of the grants. Um, every year I get, or every round I get um, a couple applications where I have to quickly contact them on the day they they put it in, usually the day the receipt day, say, hey, you didn't include the out years. Can you try to add those really quick? Um, I talked about this already. You know, make sure you explicitly deal with the rigor uh, and the reproducibility of your data. Uh, complete your registration six to eight weeks in advance. Consider submitting your application early for just the reason I talked about. I could tell you on the last round of applications, I was able to look at the applications quickly through and find a few little things like, hey, you didn't include um, your budget sheets or, hey, you know, you you put stuff in here that doesn't belong and you're going to get rejected. Um, so those kind of things I can hopefully, if I, you know, if you do it early enough, I can see it and, and respond to it if you can have, you have time to correct it. Uh, if, as I mentioned before, if you're going to go over 500K in direct costs for the UG3 UH3 maximum six to eight weeks in advance, you need to let me know. Um, that you want to do that. You know, I'll need actual budgets with justifications written out. Uh, and there's a process we have to go through to get the ARA and whatever institute that mission you're in, we'll, we'll take it through that process. So let us know early. Um, talk with your tech transfer folks and your business development folks as early as possible. Um, it's really important that you do that um, because they need to support the patent activities that are going to happen down the road. And if they don't support it, the program could end because that's part of the mission is to be able to have a commercially available or viable project. Some things not to do. Don't, don't plan on this being your sole source of funding uh, because it's milestone driven. It can, um, your program can end abruptly. Um, do not under-resource your budget to avoid the limits, you know, if you need $550,000 and you put $500,000, you might be able to swing that. But if you need like $800,000 and you put $500,000 down to avoid the limit, that's a problem um, and not one easily solved later on. I would rather deal with the ARA up front than try to deal with that stuff at the backside having, because it requires going to council, it requires getting approval for money from the other ICs, all of which are huge hurdles and very time consuming. So do not uh, plan on BPN to provide disease biology resources or one-off in vitro experiments. If you're coming as a development project and you say, hey, I need this additional data that I didn't have, um, one-offs are, are difficult for us to do. If it's a whole program of getting data to say you have a proposed development candidate, but you have to actually, the first year go, no go is really doing some DRF studies and finishing the characterization of in vitro happy profile according to so like the 2020 FDA guidelines. That can be part of the proposal to do and be part of the go, no go decision criteria. Um, do not code your application as a clinical trial if you plan to use the BPN contractors for doing the clinical trial. Uh, meaning it's not a human subject application if plan at the end of the day is to use do a healthy volunteer study through our BPN contracts. That's a, um, we'll do that same human subject paperwork when we do the contract side. Um, but you, if you do plan on doing it, it's a delayed onset clinical trial and you need to have all the paperwork that's required for that. 
um, do plan on at least giving in that target product profile uh, for your project a good indication of what the indication area is and what the clinical trial for phase two might look like um, in terms of patient population endpoints and stuff. So we are accepting new applications and starting in, uh, for the February 9th receipt date. Uh, it will be reviewed by a special emphasis panel. Uh, the following indications are, are listed in the FOA and you'll see them uh, when you look there. While we do take pain and un, under a number of different indications and you can apply to the BPN for pain, um, I want to at least make you aware before I end that there is also a new uh, funding opportunity for non-addictive analgesic therapeutics developments, um, small molecules and biologics to treat pain that's very much like BPN. Um, it has you know, a lot of the same, if you're in a small molecule space, it has all the same resources um, as the BPN does. It's gonna be set up and run very similarly with the uh, uh, LDTs and all of that, uh, but it's really, uh, a heel set aside for pain. Um, and so this will be, a, it's a separate project and gives you a second opportunity to consider for this. These have uh, receipt dates three times a year rather than twice a year. So for the next uh, few years. Um, so just be aware of that. If you're coming in for a pain indication, you may want to contact me and talk about which is the better choice for you. This, this also has, um, or whereas the BPN doesn't really have a biomarker component. This does allow for biomarker work and, and actually is seeking work on biomarkers for pain. So, so with that, I'll end um, the, the, my talking part and turn it over for question part. Tim? The questions themselves can be across the, the spectrum of stuff. Um, application process, review process, budgets, proposals, contracts, intellectual property, all of that. Okay, just to give you everyone a heads up, uh, the way that you're going to submit your questions, and several of you have already done this, and I appreciate that, is through the Q&A box. Uh, the way that you can find the Q&A box, if you don't see it already, it's located in your lower right-hand corner. There's uh, three dots. You just click on that, and you'll see the Q&A. Uh, try to not use the chat box for any questions. Um, if you've already used the chat box for a question, do not submit your question again. I've already gotten it, uh, transferred it over. But for now, uh, we will be taking the Q&A from the Q&A box. So Chuck, uh, you should be able to see the questions. Okay. So I answered the first question that I got, which is are these grants generally awarded to academics uh, or to startup companies? And in fact, um, we've had more academics than startups, but we've had both successfully um, move projects to the clinic in, within the BPN. Um, are the therapeutics indications given greater priority? Are some therapeutic area given greater priority? Well, it's within each IC. Um, and so each individual institute or center uh, dictates what they'll fund. And so for NINDS, I can tell you for, for neurology, we have 600 indications. We do not, uh, sector plus, we do not say one is higher than the other. Um, you know, in um, NIA, for instance, and Alzheimer, obviously they have uh, an Alzheimer's ADRD funding pool, which is higher than and a bigger pool than their other indication areas. But um, I wouldn't know they'd say one is a higher priority than that. Um, previously, a molecule that had, had to be in discovery or development phase had to be, had to be at the discovery. And now it's a change so the LGBT could stage it could be a stage between discovery and development. Um, so as I described as discovery and development, so if you are in BPF, you're still doing missile chemistry, you're in discovery. Um, if you have said, this is my clinical candidate, you're in development. If you are saying I have two or three compounds and I just need to characterize these compounds to figure out which one is my clinical candidate. You're in development, but you need to figure out what those, that in that preparatory phase, what are the key experiments you need to do to get to that one compound? Because MedChem has stopped, but you're, you, you're trying to distinguish between maybe a couple choices. Um, again, if you have questions about that, we can talk about it. But if you look in the FOA, you'll see what is acceptable for 
um, that preparatory phase, and you'll see a lot of people, you know, for instance, the development phase can come in and it's acceptable to run DRFs, it's acceptable to repeat the efficacy study. It's acceptable to go back and, and potentially get the um, required in vitro add me for FDA, like the transporter panels and the SIP phenotyping and all that. Uh, but it would have to have clear to go no uh, milestone, go no go milestones associated with that to say, you know, if we see this, we're going to stop. If we don't, if we see that, we're going to go forward. Okay. How many applications have been funded from academic PIs? Um, Many. I don't have the exact number in front of me. I think we're at 30 something application or 30 something projects and county 33 maybe. Uh, and at the first iteration, it was about 80% academics for the first, I want to say 15 to 20 app of those. So it's a large number of academics by far more academics than, than small businesses have been overall historically when i look over the nine years it's been going on uh, or 10 years it's been going on so um but small businesses do well as well so um what are the key criteria by which reviewers assess the quality of blueprint proposals there is not one indication or one key criteria they are looking you know our our special emphasis panel looks at the disease biology. Tim, I get a lot of background noise or something. Are, is your, are you muted? Um, uh, the key criteria are really an amalgamation. So they look at the disease biology. They look at the drug uh, discovery issues, MedCam, PK, tox, whatever it is, and look at the overall gestalt of that and say, do, this, do they think this project has uh, potential to move forward? Obviously, an early stage project, um, the relative risk can be higher than a later stage project, right? In terms of what's unknown. There's a lot of unknowns in the beginning. As I picked a development candidate, there should be a lot less unknowns at that point. Um, and so the reviewers will be looking at in that sort of stage appropriate thing, saying, well, yep, we have appropriate milestones. They don't know anything about whether this is working in vivo yet, but that it'll be an early, relatively early milestone. They'll have some ideas. Once they get a tool compound, they can do it with. Um, so it's really everything. Um, so I guess I didn't make that clear. There's a question about budgets and contracted projects. So. Anything that's NIH is contracting, you do not budget in your budgets. So it's really important that um, you clearly delineate what it is you're going to do. That way I can be sure that you've covered everything um, because a lot of people come into this program that are not necessarily familiar with the drug discovery process from uh, soup to nuts and that's why they're coming to the program. Uh, so it's really important to say, hey, I think I'm going to do this, especially if you're proposing to do almost everything yourself. I really want to make sure you've covered everything I think the PPN is going to require you need um, in order to meet the milestones. Uh, but anything that PPN is uh, doing through NIH contracts, you are not putting in your budget. You just budget for what you need. Uh, do PPN contracts help with improving bioavailability of compounds? Uh, yes. I assume you're talking about you know, well, obviously, there's a number of different ways to improve bioavailability of compounds. So, um, if if we're talking about oral bioavailability, yes, we can do things uh, like formulation type work to improve the bioavailability of compounds. Um, if it's a solubility issue, again, we can fix it. But I'm not sure where that question is. Just bioavailability, or is it really improving the exposure? And that is all about the SAR and 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 balancing things like clearance and plasma protein binding and all that so that you can get, you know, what your free fraction is really is what matters. Um, compounds two to four, okay, maybe, may, compounds two to four maybe potentially have equal or better efficacy or at least can serve as backups, will be valuable to garner investor interest. Can I design specific aims to move ahead with compound one as well as other aims to evaluate compounds two to four further? No. So once, the whole purpose of this program, we, we don't have unlimited funds, unfortunately. Uh, our whole purpose of our program is to be on the uh, 
main line of getting you from point A to the clinic. Uh, so you can certainly apply for another grant to do backup work, but this program is will be focused on trying to move the best compound forward as quickly as possible. Uh, so at some point we'll choose between them and the other ones will go to the side. Um, picking between a couple compounds uh, is, is we can do some preliminary kind of work on it, but we will not do extensive evaluation. For instance, we won't do like full DRFs on both or two or four compounds to, to figure out which one is the best one tox. We'll base it on perhaps some earlier work, some in vitro tox, and then, and then pick the best compound to go into DRF, the rat rodent DRF type thing. Uh, does a startup need to have full-time employees to qualify for SBIR? So that's an SBIR specific rule. And this is where I say you should really talk to the SBIR people, but I, I pretty much know the answer to this question is um, you do, right? Because I have worked with virtual companies and they will typically not come in through the SBIR that forward. They'll come in through the UG3, UH3 mechanism because they can't end up meeting the SBIR rules. Because keep in mind, SBIR says in, in phase one, 66% of the money needs to come in and stay with the small business interest. And in phase two, greater than 50% needs to stay with the small business interest. So that's where you run into the problem. If you if the money is just coming in and going out to contractors for research work, you, you won't meet the SBIR rules. Um, there are, so how, how many awards, I get the same question every time, how many awards per cycle do we make and what are the pay lie trends? We don't have a pay line, they're not, um, they're not percentile grants, they're scored. Um, and we typically uh, fund grants every cycle. Um, that number varies depending on each grant and the availability of funds and the IC's interest in the applications. Uh, what I can say is it's extremely rare that I have a really high scoring application that doesn't get funded. Um, it usually comes down to a mission problem, uh, if that's the case. Um, or, you know, so like the one case I'm thinking in my head where I, I can't say I've never had it, it was one where it came in as a development project in, a, in one of the ICs that didn't take development projects. And they didn't, uh, I couldn't convince them to fund it. They wanted them to come back in and to their own FOAS and apply through that. So that's what they did. Um, can the grants, only involve the use of, can these grants only involve the use of cell products like exosome stem cells? Not for this. This is a small molecule program for EPN. Um, however, depending on the indication area you're talking about, um, I have two pieces of advice. First off, if it's NINDS, there's a program called Create Bio where this would fit. Um, and uh, uh, Anne Marie Brome is the uh, program. Uh, director for that program and I would contact her about this or you can reach out to me and I can make the introduction for you and you know long term um, we obviously uh, a while back uh, about a year ago we had a concept clearance for BPN for biologics and that's a program that will eventually hopefully uh, uh, see reality and uh, that will be a future availability uh, type thing but for now if you're in an NDS admission go to create bio um, and there are other ICs have, you know, for instance, NIA has a, a cooperative agreement, U01, that will do biologics, which will also take this program for NIA's mission. I'm not sure about some of the other things. So if we already have a lead for Parkinson's disease, can we apply to UH3 directly? No one can apply to UH3 directly. Um, you would apply to UG3 and look very carefully. And when you say you have a lead, um, would you meet all of our milestones for a lead? meaning you've already run all the DRF studies, you've run all that. So um, yes, you may have had a compound, but you don't have a clinical candidate yet. So you st you'd be a development project, that preparatory phase would be what you would need to get the data that we would be uh, expecting prior to going to a GLP talk studies. If you have all that data and you want to go directly to GLP talk studies, uh, contact me and we can talk about it. Um, if you need to go straight to the clinic, you can a different photo altogether. Can we comment on what are key milestones to move from phase one to phase two and move into med chem? 
So for SPIR, so we'll, as I said, the preparatory phase, don't get me wrong, we don't, it's not like we don't do any med chem, but the early med chem, you know, if you were coming in an exploratory phase, the med chem would be around um, doing, showing the assays are working, showing me we have real SAR, um, you know, reproducing the synthesis, showing that we have analogs across the spectrum of potencies. It's not all binary, all, you know, all micromolar or nothing. Um, show me that uh, I have SAR that tracks with structure, that tracks with structure property relationships that I can I can leverage. If you're coming in in between that, so I'm coming in hit to lead, for instance, or lead optimization, it's the same thing. You come in and say, I want to start lead optimization, or I want to start hit to lead, or I want to start lead optimization. And we have started projects at that stage. You just have to you would have to put in your application, here's the proof I've met all those other early milestones, and now I want to do this um, part there. Would the peptide therapeutics fall under this program? That's a gray area. Depends on the size of the peptide. If it's a small peptide, something less than like five or less amino acids, we could talk about whether it would be a fit for BPN and whether we could help you out. Um, if it's bigger than that, I would say no. You would want to go to create bio or another biologics program. Will there be a second? Yes, there are submission. This so that's about submission dates. There, if you look in the FOA, and it's part about reading the FOA carefully, you'll see there's submission dates for the next uh, several rounds for February and August uh, for the next couple of years. Um, have there been any changes from the PAR from? PAR 18.541, which is the SBR version previously to the PAR uh, 20-111, and the answer is yes. There have been some small changes and tweaks to the FOA, but it's largely the same. Read the FOAs carefully. Um, what if one compound is efficacious in multiple indications, such as epilepsy, pain, Parkinson's disease, animal models? You need to pick the one that you think is the most appropriate uh, for this project, where you think the data is best, uh, where you're going to go to first in the clinic in terms of your phase two work. That's where you should be focusing on, in on uh, because each IC is going to want to know that you're going to, into something in their mission and that they, you know phase two and beyond is going to be something in their mission. Um, in this particular case where someone listed pain, epilepsy, and Parkinson's, that's, that's all NINDS. But from a review perspective, you want to at least say from your target product profile, hey, I'm going for pain as my first indication area. If in fact you're going, you know, you could make an argument saying, hey, pain's my first indication area, but I have this small patient population that I can get a quick read on in phase two, that'll be my entryway to a larger phase two for pain, great. You can do that, and you just have to do it. But it would probably be ruled as the first indication area first, and then pain second. Uh, but from your perspective, it it doesn't change what you're doing. Um, I guess I should have got a glass of water, Tim. Um, can these grants only involve the use of cell products? I, we, I answered that question already. It's a repeat. Um, have projects that use phenotypic screens been funded historically? Uh, we have funded some uh, phenotypic type projects. Uh, for instance, familiar dysautonomia uh, project that we had with Seuss Logenhoff, which was quite successful. It was licensed for, out of us um, by PTC Therapeutics in the lead optimization phase. Um, it was a phenotypic type project. Uh, does the BPN require a commercial plan? Under the SBIR uh, applications, a full commercial plan like any SBIR program is a requirement. Under the UG3 UH3, there's a requested one to two page patent strategy um, uh, document that you need to include, and that uh, should discuss the commercial uh, aspects of the program, how you're going to get there. So the next question is one, again, I get a lot about. Are repurposed compounds that are not currently indicated for CNS disorders appropriate for this mechanism? It's really iffy on that because um, m most repurposed compounds are coming in anything directed beyond phase one or phase two or, or beyond phase one are out of scope 
And so many repurposed things are really the work that's being proposed is talks and, and stuff that's directed to take you directly back to phase two. Um, and so that's difficult to uh, justify. So again, it, the devil's always in the details of that. Uh, STTR, uh, we do not have an STTR version for our SBIR uh, or for this funding opportunity announcement. So the answer is no, there's no STTR. There's an SBIR and the um, UG3, UH3. So if you're going to be, um, if you can't meet the SBIR rules with your academic partner, then I would say suggest coming to the UG3, UH3 phase. What is the relation of UG3 to the preparatory phase? They're one and the same. Same, So it's just a, the preparatory phase is what I, I put to it is UG3 or the U44 phase one is what we refer to the preparatory phase. I'd give it a common name for both. Um, we are currently funded by NINDS phase one SBR. Is it possible to apply to a rec for phase two? And the answer again is no. Uh, these are all fast track applications. They have to come into phase one. Uh, for foreign entities, what are requirements uh, versus what is, was discussed on the slide before foreign entities is a pass-through subcontract and the prime is a US entity. So there's a difference between a foreign institution grant and a foreign component. A foreign component is a lot easier. It, that's just a State Department approval process. Um, and But a foreign application is a different uh, thing altogether. Uh, and it requires that secondary approval I was talking about through council. Should we include and include PPN activities in, in the budget or, or is the budget only for the PI's lab? I answered that question only the PI's lab, only the PI and their and their co-investigators. So PPN contracts are not part of yours. Consultants that we're funding are not part of your budget. Um, what approaches to provide strong recoveries really have been successful. Um, you should look, there's a lot of literature on on this subject um, and uh, you should definitely do that. Uh, no, don't, Tim, you're going too fast. Uh, outsourcing to CROs to validate. Uh, again, we do not, you could potentially, uh, you know, do whatever it is you need to do uh, on your side, uh, but you know, that would need to be done prior, you know, and to uh, identify strong rigorous data that you're presenting in your application. Uh, so as long as you can make a good case that this, you know, that your preliminary data is uh, rigorous data, blinded, controlled, try to eliminate as many kinds of biases as you can think of, uh, think about properly powering it, all of that so that you can, you know, the reviewers will believe the data, then it's time well invested. For biologic um, disease specific assay, what are limits for outsourcing? There are no limits for you to outsource something to someone else that's just a co-investigator or, uh, like I said, in, in a virtual pharma setting, I have seen this where, you know, all of that work is being done through a CRO. Um, so it can be done that way. You just won't be able to do that within an SBIR setting. You have to do that through a UH3, UG3, UH3 mechanism. Um, and that includes in vivo biology efficacy studies, if you so chose. Uh, Ignite is a five-year grant, right? Uh, no, it's not. It's a th uh, Ignite is a three-year grant mechanism, I believe. Is a PhD candidate eligible to serve as a PI to an SBIR grant through the PPN program? Again, that's an SBIR specific question and you would need to direct that to the SBIR program and these two you are serving because you're asking whether you would be eligible for SBIR. Um, but if you own the business and you're, you know, an employee of that business, then I would say it's theoretically possible you would need to have a conversation with them. It's whatever the institution considers it meets the criteria for a PI, but look carefully at what NIH uh, criteria are for what a PI needs to be and what the affiliation needs to be. Um, do we know need to know the exact mechanism of action for the candidate? No, you do not. So, 
Um, knowing the target is not a requirement. Obviously, how you're going to prosecute the program in a phenotypic way is going to be important to tell the re reviewers how it is you're going to execute the SAR program. Um, Entering into the development phase, what is the data needed? So on that slide you saw with my milestones, let's say, Tim, I'm going to see if I can go back quickly. Oops, too far. So on this slide, I'm sorry, we have to be somewhere obviously in a few minutes. Um, so on the slide for a development candidate, you can see if you meet all the pre-development and development criteria, you're going to be there, actually, lead authorization pre-development. So do you have your PKPD relationship established? Have you established a therapeutic index in the rodent or that um, that's reasonable? Do you have a large animal uh, TI based on a do uh, dose range finding study there? Do you have a, you know, do you know what the form of the molecule needs to be? Is it going to be a salt? If so, which salt, what polymorph, all of that? Um, do, do we have a tractable, cost-effective route that we can synthesize the molecule under? Um, and do we have some input from a clinical specialist on our plans going forward? That would sort of be the minimum to saying I have a development candidate, per se. Um, now, let's say you didn't have all of that. You only say, I have the P PKPD, I think I had this molecule. That's fine. You're still in the development project, but now that preparatory phase is going to be about maybe scaling up the material and doing the dose, uh, doing the dose range finding study in tox for rodents and showing I have a, a therapeutic index for that, maybe doing the salt stream polymorph work. That may be all you could accomplish in year one, and you need to hit tick all three of those in order to continue to phase to the next phase of the program. So you're sort of a development project, but you're still in the discovery aspects of it. Uh, can you subcontract for an academic laboratory more than one third of the budgets under an SBIR? Uh, more than one third, not in the phase one section, in the phase two you could, in theory. Um, but not in phase one of an SBIR. Um, looks like we are uh, at out the end. Time. Yeah, we are out of time and actually out of questions. So ooh, we okay, had that okay, it worked well. Yep. Yeah, uh, so um, just as a heads up, we will be sending out the, um, the slides to everybody. And uh, I actually was able to get um, a majority of the webinar recorded. So. Um, we will send you out a copy of that as well. Um, if uh, you have any questions, uh, just let me know. Like I said, you will get an email from me um, within, I'd say, by the end of the week with, it, if at the very least, the slides. So thank you very much for joining us.